Okay, so with our, our part, we um, uh, you know worked with programs that you could put the tool pass on separate levels, be able to manipulate it. That's not really what we work with. In the tool and the operations, that's where we're able to show and, and hide those, those values or uh, those, uh, those items. So first thing we're going to do is um, I'm looking at the, uh, the tool pass pull down in the machine. We go under mill and if we just pick the default, uh, the, uh, the standard installation will be the default. Uh, when we um, uh, get a little further in, we'll switch it over to the Haas control and do a little bit more. So I don't want to spend a lot of time with that tonight. We want to go through the basics of a machine group. All right, so the machine group is going to be the compartment, the container for the operations that we're, we're working in. So under the properties, first thing you're going to do is double click on files and your machine group properties come up. And if you wanted to change the name, change the directories, um, be able to, uh, to change the, uh, the machine or point to any of these other locations, this gives you the options to change those out. At the very bottom, if you want to output additional, so group names, group comments, output machine name, most of the time the operation comments are, are enough. But if you want additional information to go out with the post, this is where we're going to turn those on. So a lot of times I just give this a cursory glance. If there are more than one or I'm using programming for more than one machine, then I will go back and um, uh, make sure that I have the correct post file for this. Um, uh, for this part. Jerry, yep. tool paths, which one was the pull down for machine group? Uh, to get into this, yeah. you come over to the machine and you're actually the very... Uh, so just go ahead and go to machine. Go to machine yeah, and then uh, the far I just left. I tool paths and it just appeared on one. <laughs> <laughs> so under the mill, when you pull do the pull mount, it's either going to go to the default or if you have more than one control, you have three different machines out on the floor you're going to have to pick and be able to uh, to go through that, um, that list. Also, if we were doing a mill lathe combo, maybe the first part of the, uh, the operation, we chuck it up in the lathe, we do some turning, and then we're going to put it over in, into the mill and hold it some other way. We can do all of that out of one program and have the different machine groups manage the lathe and the, uh, the mill as we go. And then expanding out under the properties, I just double click on files. Just out of habit, I'm going to look through all of these tabs. And the general rule is all of the tabs, all of the settings, everything, every time. All right, tool settings, a couple of things that uh, I need to dig for because they kind of annoy me here. Uh, default program number is going to be one. We don't typically have a program zero. We do want to assign the tool numbers sequentially. I do want to be warned of duplicate tools, uh, tool numbers. Um, let's see, the tool can have override and have priority. So if we've set up our, our tool list, um, those values in our tool crib, then we can have those take precedence over uh, from the material, from the defaults, or user defined. Most of the time, I'm still going to go through, load up the tool, look at its operations, does it make sense, look at its parameters, does it make sense. And we're not going by tool numbers, so I don't really worry about that one. Uh, let's see, override defaults, clearance height, retract. Now we pretty much set those out of the, um, out of the operation. Adjust feed on arc move. Now that's one place to put it in, but um, pretty much what that's saying is that if you are really just traveling at a high rate of speed, you're removing a lot of material very fast, but you come to a very small mark at the arc at the end of that travel, that you'll get a lot of tool deflection. You'll get a, a slot or you'll get a piece of geometry that is anywhere from five to 30 thousandths undersized because that tool had to change direction so fast. The material move, the tool move, uh, depends on all the cutting conditions. So we can have it go across the part at say 50 inches a minute. When it gets to that arc move, it slows down to 10, travels through the arc, and then speeds back up to 50. All right, so I think there's still better places to put that because that is kind of a global override. 
these are setting for all of the um, all of the parameters. I don't really like sequence numbers by hundreds, so we'll start at one and go by ones. A lot of times I will just turn those off, mainly because uh, we get into the the more intensive programs or three axis. I'm not looking for a, uh, a sequence number. I'm not looking for that end number to tell me where I found an error. Uh, it's just too much information, too much data. All right, where it's valuable, then we, we leave them turned on. For the material 2024, if I go to edit, these are those machine definitions, those parameters that this is going to refer to. We can go in and build a lot of information. Um, I haven't seen anybody using this like really effectively, so I show it to you, but you're pretty much, um, uh, I'm not, I'm not going to go very far into it, let's put it that way. So we have the operations, uh, you get the, um, uh, the base surface feed per minute, percentage of base to make each of those items, and then it returns a value as your defaults. So you still need to look at those and make sure that they're realistic. And then um, based on the, uh, the tool, how much um, uh, feed per tooth, how much surface feed per minute you're going to get. And then on the select, if we come back over to mill and library, we're going to have the list of 6061. Uh, if we're going over to the uh, the steels, we have 1010, 1030, which are going to be pretty close to the range of 1018, 1020, hot rolled, cold rolled steels. Um, basic plastics, you know, the titaniums, the woods. <laughs> All right, so. I want to stay with the uh, the 6061, and most of the time this is a reminder. If I do set it against the material, then I'm building in a little bit more into that database. But a lot of times I'm just I'm content to get numbers that are close and make adjustments as I go. All right, the all important stock setup, and this one is always kind of uh, kind of weird when you look at the picture and think about what it's telling you, is that our x and y dimension is two and a half by two and a half. These values are always positive. The Z distance, and I lost my, uh, my screen over here, is one inch. All right. And then what we're having to do with the stock origin is by default, it's going to be, uh, we're not gonna be right on the, uh, the center. It's gonna move and shift this over. So I need to take half of this value, 1.25, and minus 1.25 to define to shift from this center point up to the um, to the actual origin. All right, so it, it's calculating based on that information. When we get a little further along, uh, we'll use the uh, the select corners, the bounding box, the solids. We'll utilize those, but you got to have a pretty good handle of what's going on here to bring up those values. All right, so when I rotate this over, oh, I'm not showing the stock. Uh, so let's see, tool pass, transform, maybe it was on, on view. Oh, I have to find, oh, it was back on that screen. Let's, let's display it. All right, so display, uh, we're looking at the wireframe. You can turn it over to solid. Solids get a little, um, little busy. We go ahead and hit OK. I can verify that those red dashed lines are taking up the, uh, the solid. So let's go back real quick, and I'm going to set my X to zero and my Y to zero. And go ahead and hit OK. Notice the shift. It's trying to put the center of my stock at the origin. All right. So all I'm doing is telling it to shift over by half my, uh, uh, half my width, half my height. So I need to position this, 1.25 minus 1.25 is what's telling that stock. So one of the things that it used to do that I'm not sure if it still do, it does, but if you don't put anything in the stock, when you go to post this, it will ask you all these questions every single time. It's amazingly how amazing how annoying it can be to have to enter those values every time you go to post the code. Take the time to build up your stocks and set up and uh, uh, get those values to where they are, are working. All right, um, so we are, we're in the top plane, and I need to hit Alt and 1. So that takes me back to my front view or my top, my top view. Alt and 2 goes to the front. 
Alton 3 goes to the back, 4, bottom, Alt 5, right side, Alt 6, the left side, Alt 7, isometric. All right, so I wanted to be in that top, Alt 1. And so if I, with the, uh, the middle mouse button being set to rotate, if I rotate it around or I have a 3D mouse and it's set to rotate, I'm out of position again. Then Alt 1 on the keyboard is going to be my fastest method to get it back in there. All right, so just notice that um, I did not draw the, uh, the chamfers on these, so I'm going to jump back into levels, go back to my original object, and make sure that it's current, and then I will kick those off. All right, so that whole, um, they are not dependent on each other. We have a lot of independent objects. You have to be aware of their condition, what, what you're telling it to do, so that you're not picking, you know, making selections uh, based on faulty information. So again, these were, uh, you know, the object two was pretty much just an example. But if I wanted something in there to uh, act as a, another orientation or pick into those geometries, I could put those on different levels to, to manage them. All right, so once we have the, um, the property set up, then we're going to have a toolpath group. And that toolpath group is now a subcontainer where we're going to put all the operations. So uh, last week we set up the tool crib. I don't have the tool crib, so I'm going to do the alternate. If you have your tool crib from, uh, from last week or you go through and you set one up, I'm going to recommend you use it and stay with, with those tools. They're going to give you better values and better consistency. Uh, since I haven't set one up, then this is, again, the alternate where we go through as a process as we're creating the operations. I'm adding tools. I'm reusing those tools. And I'm going, um, basically, uh, setting it up as I go. All right, so again, I am a um, uh, more of a right mouse button. Everything that is on the right mouse button is also up on the ribbon bar. All right, so if you are more comfortable coming up and picking a contour, a face, a pocket, then going to the mill toolpath and telling it a contour, a face, a pocket, wherever it went, <laughs> it's down there somewhere right there, <laughs> or go to a pocket, <coughs> then pick whichever one you're, you're more comfortable with working, working in. All right, so with the, um, uh, the introductory information, one of the things that um, we're working up to is the MOT, or machine operations and tooling. Out of habit, there are, there's going to be that, that cookbook, those recipes that we'll work into. As a general rule, we face. We establish our Z level, and then we, then we contour, run around the perimeter, uh, bring the part to size. If I have oddball cut stock and I can't get it to thickness and I can't get it to clean up all the way around, I can reject that part right away. I don't have to do all the rest of the operations. I don't have to build anything else into it. We go to the next part. The other thing that we're considering here is at this point, my zero zero is right there on the origin. So at the control, I'm telling this to move over 50 thousandths and down 50 thousandths to accommodate for the material. So if we're starting off with what is the material size? Three inch by three inch to look, you know, we saw cut it out of plate and it's um, two and five eighths by two and five eighths. We have to take that into consideration. All right, so if I'm not sure about what the material is going to be, then I'm going to leave this at the origin and let it be driven at the control. But if I know that I'm getting two and three quarter inch material, uh, bar stock that is one inch, if it's one inch thick, we got a problem cutting it to one inch in the vise. All right, going to have to do a little clamping or something else. Um, so I'm probably getting one and a quarter inch material to have that sacrificial oversize to, even though I have to flip it over and, and sacrifice that bottom material, it's still going to be faster in the long run in a production environment. So that brings us to how many. If we're making one, I, I can probably knock this out on a, on a manual about as fast as I can program set it up. I'd have a real, real hard time, unless there's not a manual in the shop, which uh, does happen. If um, uh, we need to make uh, 10 of these, I'm going to be a little bit more efficient. At 100, I'm getting a <laughs> little more picky. At 1,000, I'm very picky. If this machine is going to run these parts for the next six months, and seconds become hours, become days, I want every operation to be right there. All right, so a part of our iteration, part of our setup is get one out on the machine, see what the material conditions are, see what the tool conditions are, 
and then we start the iteration process of, I got one that's good. Once I see it run, then I can make decisions and make it run a little bit better. By the time we get through the fifth or sixth part, uh, then I should have another rendition ready to go. And uh, that, that next uh, revision, we load up, maybe I save um, you know, 20, 20, 30 seconds. And on the, that thousand piece order, I'm going to start looking for seconds after, uh, after too long. All right, so we get it the cycle times two. We're able to, to uh, get the good parts, the, the tolerance parts, and good uh, tool life, and then we go from there. All right, so that facing operation establishes the top. Are we going to take the time to do tool changes? All right, if it's a, um, uh, a cycle that I am looking for 30 seconds, maybe I change to the three inch fly cutter and fly across the top of the park. If it's one of those, eh, I really don't want to do another tool change, I'll, I'll do the same half inch tool and zigzag across the face of the part. Depending on the rigidity of the machine, um, how, much, um, you know, the, how much the machine's been used, the wear on the machine, because we're lo loading and unloading those ball screws uh, going left to right and right to left, we can end up with a little bit of a wave across that top surface. If that's a concern, then I need to pick a different tool. So we have all of these little decisions that we're going to make as we go through, and they're going to refine as, um, uh, as we go in. So I'm going to do this as the, we're going to take this out to the TM and run it, and after uh, we go to the lab, that was the part we ran last time, and probably part we'll try again. So I have that for, uh, for reference. I actually ended up making these quarter 20 tap tools so that we could look at the, uh, the difference, and that'll come up with the, uh, the tapping routines between rigid tapping and floating tapping. So this was the floating tapping since the uh, machines aren't set up with rigid. All right, so made a few decisions we're going to face. And so mill tools, pick the facing, and then we start looking at the operation. So the pop-up, pay attention to these because it will save us some time. Select OK to use user-defined stock. We already defined that stock. It knows where the boundaries are for that limit. I can go ahead and hit OK, and it puts me right into the facing. This is going to be the interface, our, our manager for all of the 2D toolpaths and most of the 3D toolpaths. Uh, how did you get into that? I'm sorry. Okay, so. One second. Uh, no, I'm keep that one. So you can either come up to face on the ribbon or right click, mill tool pass, and face. Once we're into that group, that's where it's gonna ask you for the okay. And then we're into the, uh, the group. So tool path type, we can switch between facing to contour to pocket. And the chain geometry, I, I'll point this one out, we don't really need to do anything with the face, but chain geometry is my preference when we get to the contours. I don't like guessing, I don't like the way that um, under the cut parameters, we can go from climb to conventional. That doesn't give me good information, or doesn't give me my information. <laughs> All right, so the tool is defaulted to a two inch face mill. If I want to select the library tool, we said we're going to pick a um, one inch, or a, a half inch. I will filter, and we're going to go to none so that I can switch to a standard end mill. And then whatever we have for size, make sure the filter is active, and I'm looking for half inch. All right, so for most uh, convenience, because of the price, the crossover, the quality of carbide, uh, you can get uh, you know, a, a lot of productivity out of a half inch end mill. And into a lot of this geometry, decent size will cover most of the, um, uh, the issues. So you know, the fallback, the default uh, tool, really is the half inch flat end mill. All right, so notice that it changed from two inch, tool number went to one, length offset, diameter offset, and uh, a head selection. All right, so when we look at the, uh, the router, that one actually had, had heads that you could select for which, uh, which tools would engage and uh, values. If you, um, if you pick a, a different length offset, this is your T, T value, this is your H value, this is your D value. So unless you're overriding those and really doing it for a reason, 
all of these should be the same. Uh, we're going to look at speeds and feeds for the uh, lab tonight. Uh, so uh, feed rate, this is based on that calculation. So a half inch tool, we said we're doing 6061 aluminum carbide. What is the limitation of the machine? So if I set this at a 4,000 RPM and hit tab, then the numbers update. So we have a sur surface feed per minute of 5, or 523, and our feed per tooth right now is showing at 4 tenths. That's a little light. So 6 inches per minute, we'll go up to, let's just go to 12 as, a, as an intermediate starting point. Not quite a thousandth, we're still right there at finishing. But technically, I want this spacing operation to be kind of a nice finishing pass. So plunge rate, we'll do about the same since it um, can't really uh, get in too far. The rapid retract. And I don't do too much with the, uh, the holders. If you're doing something with clamps or you have uh, enough solid geometry to look at those, um, uh, those interferences, those possible collisions, then use the holders. But... Uh, for the most part, I just go with the defaults and let it um, let it go. So we get to the cut parameters, and do I want to go one way? So it will travel across the part, lift up, go back, go one way, lift up, go back one way. Like I mentioned with the uh, the ball screw issue, if I have a machine that has a little wear on it, and um, changing direction puts that wave in, then I want to load those ball screws in the same direction on every pass. We can go. Um, zigzag. So it does the arcs at the end. That's probably the most efficient. If it is a large enough tool, it should have defaulted to one pass. So at two and a half inches uh, on the width of the part, if I selected a three inch face mill or a three inch fly cutter, it should just go all the way across the part, one pass. And then the dynamic is a little bit closer to the tracoidal tr cut where it is trying to find the most uh, most efficient constant loading. So we'll hold that one off on that one and just go with zigzag. The across overlap is how much it's going to overrun the part. So about 25% or an eighth of an inch, and then it will start into the arc and go the other way. Uh, arcs are going to be continuous motion, where if we tell it later on that um, uh, the move between goes to square. It has to come basically to a stop, change directions, come to a stop, change directions, go the other way. So those arcs, at least if it's moving in X, Y, and Z in, in a GO2 or GO3 arc move, it's going to be continuous motion throughout all of that path. Um, so eighth of an inch overrun from the edge of the part starting into the arc. The along, how much it's going to be over to the side. So 110, 55, we'll have to see what that one looks like. Uh, approach diff distance, 50%, so a quarter of an inch. Exit distance, 50%. And I'd want to increase that if I knew that the stock was eighth of an inch, quarter of an inch oversize, I would want to increase those approach and exit distances to make sure that I'm cleaning up all the parts, mainly that I'm not bringing the tool down into stock um, as, it's, as it's making its entry, as it's making the plunge. And then the maximum step over of 75% for a facing operation, I can do the 375. All right, so we're going to start with climb, even number of passes. I don't know that I have to have an even number of passes. I do want it to, uh, to, to be able to finish over all of the material. If I had a weird shape, like this is kicked over at 30 degrees and I wanted it to stay 30 degrees to that geometry, then I can change the uh, to the uh, the angle to uh, for the roughing angle. The motion between cuts then was the loops, the linear, and the rapid. High speed loops are pretty cool because they come all the way off. They make a full loop and then a full loop, and it looks like a lot of um, uh, extra moves. But if you are really flying, it might be something that's good for the machine. Stock to leave on floors. We're going to set to zero. All right, so that tells it that my Z level, I'm not doing a roughing and then coming back and doing a finishing to bring it to the Z depth. We're going into the control, I'm touching off the tools, and I'm saying in my Z value, either in the work offset or in the, probably the work offset, go down another 10 thousandths, go down another 15 thousandths until the material cleans up all the way across. We're not doing any kind of roughing, so I'll turn the, def uh, the depth cuts off. 
if we were taking a lot of material, like I needed to face off a, a half inch of material for whatever reason. Then I would be looking at maybe a quarter inch pass, a quarter inch pass finish at 10 thousandths so that we get that nice unloaded finish. And then the linking parameters. Um, this is where we need to be careful because like I said, if we have a half inch of material and I'm doing those cuts, this is from my Z value, not from the, the top of the stock or, you know, basically from the top of the, top of the stock that I defined, not what I set in the, the operation as, as depths. So if I needed, if I had a, if I know I have a half inch of material there to remove, I need to make sure that this is three quarters or one inch. I can refine that and get a little closer as we know the condition of the stock, the cutting conditions at the machine. But to be on the safe side, we're going to be on the, uh, the high side of these numbers. So the retract at one inch, feed plane at like a half an inch, if I think I have that extra material. If all we're doing is buzzing off that 10 to 15, 20 thousandths, 0.1 is fine. But you're responsible for managing those numbers. Absolute and incremental and uh, associative um, have different uh, purposes when we go over into wireframes and solids. So for the most part, I'll tend to stay in the absolutes. And that is from that Z0 or Z origin up some value. And then the um, top of stock is zero and the depth of cut is zero. So we establish that phase. And do you want to leave that depth of cut on absolute or incremental? Um, it shouldn't really matter. But yeah, I, I would say just make it a habit initially of doing absolute. If you get in the habit of doing absolute and then we go over to wireframe, we go over to where we have those multiple levels to pick from um, and you're still in absolute, then you're making a conscious decision to go over to incremental or going over to associative. It's when it's just kind of set and wow, why did it go there? That was a surprise. We don't like surprises. We want, we want it to go where we told it to go and, and no guesses. All right, we can do that with absolutes and, um, and then make those decisions later on. All right, so um, a home position, if we have uh, or need a tool change position, we'll buzz through the, uh, the filtering uh, planes <coughs> if we need to adjust, come down to coolant. Right now, flood, mist, and through tool are all turned off, and then you have other options based on the machine. All right, so um, can build in more access rotary. I kind of, after we go through the first ones, these aren't really used for standard two and a half axis, two axis, two and a half axis machining. So all I'm really doing after I finish the uh, linking parameters is jumping down to colon, making sure. All right, so we have all those check marks, tool, cut parameters, linking parameters, and I can hit the, uh, the apply or the plus and stay in the operation, or we can go ahead and hit the check mark and accept it. So somewhere in there, I managed to turn those off. So to get back into the, um, the parameters, I'm going to double click, and we're going to go back up to those cut parameters. We had it set to zigzag, and the auto angle was okay. So let's go with um, high speed loops and see what that looks like. But you don't define the feed rate. Is it, is it a rapid move? Yeah, the high speed loop. Um, that's a good question. Um, either that, or it's going to stay at the um, at the same feed rate that it was at. Okay. And then because it now sees it as something changed, we need to regenerate the dirty operation. That pulls it and shows us the the next. So you know, as short as those moves are, I really wouldn't increase the, the rapid. There have been Parts where the uh, the exciting one was I was running some uh, 43 uh, series chromoly, and I had it set to rapid because it was such a large face, such a large part with a large facing tool that this arc was pretty big and it was taking a while. I just switched it over to linear and told it to rapid to the next level, except I didn't feed it across, feed it off the part far enough. So I kept hearing this, <laughs> and then kind of a, Wow, that was an interesting noise. And then all of a sudden I heard, er, and it went quiet and it was, uh-oh. All right, so you have to be careful with these because it will destroy inserts and it will destroy tools. All right, so we rotate over, that gives us a good view. And one of the things you're gonna be responsible for is reading the, the colors and the, uh, the lines. 
So we will um, have the uh, the rapid to um, or the feed to the um, the uh, the clearance, and then feed into the part, make all of the tool moves, and then the wrap it out. All right. So I think we'll run the uh, the contour, and then we'll um, we'll look at what we need to do in uh, in the lab. All right, so mill tool pass, and we want to see or not see. All right, so at this point, I want to be able to select my next uh, my next chains. So this is kind of going to be in the way with the checkbox on the uh, the facing folder. We can come up to the toggle display on for selected operations, and when I turn it off, turn it back on. That's going to allow it to be visible, not visible. And then we'll come back to the mill tool pass, and I'm going to pick a contour. And I want to be close. So when uh, we go to contour chain one, we're setting a, a full chain, or we're going to go to a partial. Uh, I, at least starting out, I avoid window. Uh, we're not really picking anything on a point. We don't really have the, uh, the area to go with. Singles, yeah, if we're doing open. Yeah, polygon and vector. Let's just say with a, a full chain or a partial chain. Difference is that when I pick the chain, we give it the first to get the direction. And then select uh, contour chain two. I should be able to come around to the last. And we'll see if, uh, see if that got it. Now my colors aren't that great to where I'm able to, uh, to read those. So we'll see what it produced. All right, so chain geometry one, it went all the way around the part. If I'd done partial, I could have picked um, uh, one at a time. When I go to the chain geometry, it shows me the beginning. And one of the things that we'll, um, we'll take a look at is, am I going in the right direction for climb? So for, um, let's go back to the front view. So one of the descriptions I give is climb is that you are going clockwise around the part. Conventional is you're going counterclockwise around the part, looking down on uh, in the Z negative direction. So right now we would be in climb, and the tool is cutting on the outside of the part. If we reverse that, so if I come over, right click, and I change the side, then now I'm cutting the interior. So that's no good. And if I reverse the the chain or reverse the direction, then I still have to watch and make sure that that arrow is staying on the outside. So right now we've just switched over to conventional. Right, so I get to make those choices, and this is, to me, this is the better graphic, the, um, uh, the better way to visualize it. Right, so once I'm happy with the chain, then we can go back and pick up the tool. We already have the tool from previous. Because it's not the same facing operation, it did not retain the spindle speeds and the feed rates. So I'm going to update those. So this would be where, if it was in our uh, tool library, which we will take a look at uh, next week. If it's in our tool library, I would set some of these for that aluminum or for that particular machine. So you should have reasonable, uh, kind of the, the general rule too of, don't scare the operators. That's kind of bad for, <laughs> for machine operators. You shouldn't scare the setup people. You shouldn't scare yourself. I mean, that's, uh, you know, put it, I would rather see you go to a nice mid-range, a nice slow range, and look at it at the machine and go, wow, I could really speed that up then. Wow, that was really fast. Does anybody uh, else got to go clean the pants up? <laughs> that's why I wear brown pants. <laughs> there you go. All right, so cut parameters. And so the compensation direction, this will reverse that, that arrow. It will flip it to the other side. The problem is I don't have any graphics on it until it runs the program. So I'm hesitant to use the compensation. I know that I want left compensation. I verified the arrow is left compensation. I shouldn't have to do anything with that. All right, our choices are computer, which is going to calculate tool center line. So the radius of the tool away from the part. And the, um, and the control, you are entering the value, the diameter of the tool, and it is uh, it is engaging um, the G41, G42 to, to offset it. With where, we're back to tool centerline. 
But with where you're getting the G41, G42 compensation values in, in, in as part of the, uh, the line. And then the uh, reverse wear, I always have problems with that one. I need to look up the definition again. <laughs> is uh, treating it, treating it as the compensation value, but you in, it end up putting a, a negative instead of a positive or a positive instead of a negative. That one's just weird to me, so I, that's probably why I don't try to remember it. And then the uh, the tip, or the, uh, sorry, the off says that it's going to, tool center line is going to go right down the edge of the part. So if I wanted to, Go center on my object. I would I would choose off. So for a roughing pass, we'll do computer, and I don't need to uh, worry about um, uh, compensation. And this is one inch deep for a half inch tool, so I might go um, 200, 250 deep, depends on on again material. And to make this a roughing pass, I'm going to go to stock to leave on the wall. So let's leave ten thousandths on the wall. Uh, don't have to do anything with contour. I know I jumped over a couple there. So tip comp is right to the uh, the end of the tool. Rolling around the edges. Do you want to make a sharp? Do you want it to come completely off the part and then change directions? Or can it come up to that edge and roll around that edge still making it a sharp? So none would feed all the way off and uh, the sharp kind of rolls around. Infinite look ahead so it's looking all the way through that chain to for any um, uh, collisions or errors, Inter internal corner rounding radius, external corner break radius. So if I wanted to add additional, so put a five thousandths radius on there, I could make an external corner corner break radius. And then the contour type, 2D, 2D chamfer, ramp, remachining, and oscillate. Those are going to be for future reference. Right now, we're just going to focus on the 2D. Depth of cuts. So I want a max rough step of 0.25, and I'm not really worried about the, uh, the finish steps. If there's, there's a zero here, it ignores that one. Um, cut direction, we're going to step down. And then the choice is, do I keep the tool down? Because this part, we had the chain, starts here, and then it feeds off here. If I can feed off far enough, rather than doing a full retract, away up and above, I can feed right to that next level without that retract, without running into anything. I can keep it at that depth, move over, have it feed into the next next level, and then make the next pass, step, and, re and repeat. So I do like to have to keep the tool down, but if you're not comfortable with it, have it fully retract, move to the next position, and then feed back into the part. So we'll take a look at what that does. Um, lead in, lead outs. So I do not want to start at the midpoint. And so we're going to uncheck that inner exit at midpoint and close contours. Um, we're not doing anything tangent. So really, I, I don't need the arcs here. So if I turn off the entry and exit, then I can jump down to the adjust start of contour and adjust end. And so the uh, we want to extend. And the first number is the percentage. So if I were to put 100%, that means half inch extend, uh, extension for the uh, the start, half inch extension for the uh, the end. Well, I probably need that on the start because the the chamfer was 250, and the radius of the tool is 250, so that's still bringing it down pretty close. So maybe I'll go to 110 and see what that looks like, and then we can go to 50 percent. If they're going to be the uh, the same, and make sure to extend it. If they're going to be the same, these little double arrows are going to take these values and push them over from the left to the right. Or if I set the values on the right, I can push them back to the left. Breakthrough amount, if we need to go a little bit past. So I'm going to give it another 10 thousandths because of that sacrificial material. I don't want it to cut right to depth and have that really sharp edge. So as long as I'm setting up high enough with the sacrificial material, we can cut all the way around. And then when I cut off the backside, I'm not cutting right to that, um, that last little bit. Multi-passes are stepping in where the depth cuts are stepping down. So if I had a, uh, a large boss right in the middle of my, my plate that I was having to remove an inch of material all the way around, then I would do the multi-passes to remove that material stepping in. And then there's different levels of engagement. Tabs are if we need the parts to stay, stay somewhat connected. So mainly the, the router or wood was really handy. 
to leave those tabs and um, have it have it stay to where it would move as a group, but then you still had to go back and remove remove the tabs after the fact. Finally, we get to the depths. All right, so the 0.25 for the uh, the retract. I'm going to go ahead and switch all those tabs to loot. And then the depth is minus one inch. So starting from the origin, we're actually feeding that depth in. Where the incremental and the associative come in is if I have wireframe geometry or solid geometry that is set to one inch, then I can come over here and I can pick that geometry and incremental will work just fine. But that's a little confusing. Okay, that's a lot confusing. <laughs> and then we have to kind of work into, into that same mix. And then the last one we'll check is corn. All right, I see an operation. My stay down doesn't look like it's hitting anything over here or not anything that I don't want it to. So I'm okay with that. And then the finish pass becomes a copy. And let's see, I've gotten used to, nope, we're just gonna copy and then come back and paste. And now I have all of those same settings with a, with a few extras. So double clicking on the parameters puts me back into the um, into the into the tool into the cut. So we will switch it to where that's going to engage my G41 G42 <coughs> compensation. We don't need the depth cuts for a finish pass. The lead in lead out was fine. Breakthrough is still okay. Linking parameters didn't change. All I'm doing is taking off the things that I don't need. I go ahead and accept it. And the one that I missed. The wall, leave on wall. You got it. The uh, cut parameters and then the stock to leave on wall goes back to zero so that we can see that little bit of shift. When we zoom up, our, oh, this one. Um, so when you have the red X, you got to regenerate. All right, so now we see the, the multiple step and, step and repeats come down, take the finish pass. That gives us our contour. All right, so next time we will um, we'll pick up and uh, finish out the uh, the operations.